Well, Owen, thanks for jumping on today. Certainly appreciate it. Yeah, happy to be here. My pleasure. So um, first of all, tell us about your official job description with Texas Parks and Wildlife. I know you've held this position for about four years now. Yeah, it, uh, it's kind of a unique position. Um, when we deal with migratory game birds, we break everything into waterfowl and basically everything that's not waterfowl. Uh, the title is actually Webless Migratory Game Bird Program Leader. Uh, but I cover everything from doves to sandhill cranes to snipe to woodcock to rails to gallinules. Nice. Sandhill cranes. Um, that was something I, I hunted some as a younger man. And then last year I went on my, my first guided hunt compared to, you know, me and my buddy just throwing out a few decoys and <laughs> basically just pass shooting them, you know. Uh, All right. But, oh, my gosh, watching those huge birds decoy into your lap. Uh, we were out in Lubbock with um final descent and it was incredible yeah sando crane hunting has really really blown up the past few years um to the point we're we're just about double the amount of hunters almost every year the past few years mm. well i know they stay booked up so yeah um but it is interesting it's one of those things where you have to get a, a special permit but it's free yeah that kind of goes back to uh just trying to track the number of, of crane hunters um and the way that we, the way that you have to get your crane permit in Texas these days, you know, you have to go through either the website or go to a game warden um, office. And the reason we did that was because it was free. Uh, so many people got those permits that we couldn't really track who was actually doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, because a lot of people get the uh, the permit sort of like, well, maybe I'll go, might as well get it, right. but then they end up not going. So to, to get a better handle on that, that we kind of made it a little bit difficult to get. Uh, you know, you had to go through an extra step or two, but but yeah. And there's plenty of states that don't allow crane hunting at all. Yeah, it's really controversial. Um, you know, the Central Flyway has kind of been the the one flyway that's had hunting probably since the 60s. And Texas has been one of those that's really uh, embraced crane hunting. But there are several other states where it's very controversial. People don't like uh, any harvest of their, you know, their cranes. <laughs> yeah, so I just got back from South Africa and their national bird is the blue crane. And it yeah. is, it, I mean, it reminds me. Uh, every bit just like our sandhill crane and yeah. the way that they behave and fly and size and um but i mean if you shot one of those over there you'd be under the jail <laughs> yeah yeah there's a lot of cr crane populations around the world that aren't doing very well you know obviously we have uh whooping cranes here uh, one of the most endangered animals that we have uh but the one that we know is doing really well and the most numerous crane we have in the world is sandhills so uh, mm -hmm. and especially our mid-continent population that comes through texas uh is doing is very healthy these days well and they're very delicious because you, you think <laughs> of a crane like it, i just think about blue herons that are hanging out you know around every neighborhood pond in texas and what they eat frogs fish you know stuff like that probably don't taste very good uh but sandhills eat agriculture right and do they ever mix in like crustaceans and other things or is it pretty much just straight wheat and agriculture? Well, you know, as a function of their habitat and kind of where they're at, it's a lot of agriculture, a lot of seeds, uh, tubers, things like that. But um, if they happen, you know, they're, they're generalists, they'll eat whatever they can find. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if they happen upon a, a, an abundant food source somewhere, they're going to take advantage of it. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, I don't think they'd taste like beef if they weren't stocking up on... Our, uh, exactly. and that's a good thing i mean our our uh, agricultural practices in this country i'm sure is why that population is doing so well yeah that's one of the reasons yeah um and they're you know they're a big population anyway their breeding grounds range from essentially siberia all the way east to like minnesota uh, you know mm -hmm. the whole northwest uh, part of the north america so um they occupy a lot of different habitats and and they're found all over the country or all over north america um but yeah mm -hmm. they're they're, uh, they're doing really well. Um, the last, we're, we're still waiting on the results from our survey from this March from the Fish and Wildlife Service. And of course, last year's surveys were canceled due to COVID, but 2018 and 2019, the mid-continent population that we have here in Texas uh, numbered around a million birds, maybe just, just shy of a million. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Well, uh, interesting stuff on sand hills. If you haven't done it, I highly recommend it. Uh, it, is, it is a hoot to see those big birds fall and the guides yelling rain out and we've got like 10 birds falling at one time you know it's oh it's a lot of fun and absolutely great table fair um 
I really want to talk about Dove today as September 1st is right around the corner myself. And I know many other Texans will be yanking their kiddos out of school, uh, much to uh, their mother's uh, dismay, but they're going. Um, I wanted to ask you about some things on Dove biology. And this stems from my like personal experience in my backyard. I've got a, a, a outdoor speaker on the patio and there have been four clutches now of dove being hatched there they started in march they did it again in july early july and then they just had their last hatch uh, about two weeks ago and now she's back on the nest again (laughs) and i know it's got to be the same pair of dove they're doing this i read that they can have up to six um hatches in a year if conditions are right Yeah. Yeah. And I think this year conditions have been really, really good. Uh, You know, the wet weather's been kind of conducive to to uh, a lot of broods, you know, repeat nesting and things like that. And like you said, yeah, six nests um, up to six nests. Who knows? Maybe more in some years. Uh, But that's a lot. They're very prolific breeders. Uh, You're probably seeing the same pair. Uh, Mm -hmm. They will come back to the same spot to nest. Um, And uh, they're, they're very quick to lay eggs, incubate raise those chicks and move on. And there's even uh, been some documented cases. It's not uncommon for them to start a new nest before they even finish uh, fledging the chicks that they're, that they're working on at the moment. This is the quickest they've done it. I mean, those chicks were, were in the backyard last week, the, the two new ones, they're gone now. And now she's back. And um, my wife was like, those chicks are back in the nest. I was like, no, that's, that's mama again. Yeah. So I went to go take the nest down and I was like, what's the point? They just keep coming back. So, yeah. Um, but I've, they've, they've been there three out of four years mm-hmm. and they took COVID off, but they've been there every other year. Um, you think that's the same pair? I, I don't know what the lifespan is on, a, on a dove, well, but it seems like that'd be getting up there if they were four or five years old. Yeah. The average lifespan of a dove, what we know from banding studies is about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Um, but we, I do know that we get a lot of doves at, you know, up to eight or 10, 12 years old, if they're in an area that they don't get, you know, that they don't have a lot of threats, uh, whether that's, you know, hunting or, or whatever predation. Uh, but we, you know, a lot of times the young will come back and nest in the same area that they were born. Mm -hmm. So it could be the same pair could be subsequent generations of, you know, from that original pair. Uh Well, I just thought it was really cool to just see how the work that they're doing now on their fourth uh, fourth go around here, um, a year and a half, that's not a very long lifespan. So who knows? And, <laughs> but the, I would say five or six years ago around Frisco and McKinney, they, they were, probably would have been had very good odds of getting shot, but, uh, so much has been developed now that there's not as much dove hunting right around here as there once was. Yeah. Um, but, yep. And that's an issue, uh, pretty much everywhere. You know, we're seeing a, a long, slow decline in morning doves at the national level. And we think it, it probably has to do with development and loss of habitat. Uh, mm. Just, you know, as, as the human population grows, uh, there's just less room for wildlife. That's interesting. What is our statewide population of morning dove? Um, and you could give us the resident population, like when the season starts and then as the weather cools off, if, I don't know, obviously we get an influx of birds from Northern States. Mm-hmm. I don't know if our birds are heading to Mexico or Central America, but uh, break that down for us. Sure. Um, long-term average is, uh, and we do, we do surveys in the spring parks and wildlife does. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's kind of our resident population and long-term average is about 26 million. Uh, this year we're just under that at around 25 million. Um, we think those numbers swell up to 50 or 60 million in the, uh, you know, in September and October. Uh, that's really hard to measure because birds come, come and go, they come in, in, you know, different timings. So it's really hard to know for sure. But, uh, but yeah, we, we're doing well though there. Um, you know, we're kind of below average at the past few years. Um, they're mostly because in 2014 to 2016, we had a huge increase in morning doves, uh, in Texas, uh, at the same time, there's a big boom in quail populations. And so, uh, a lot of that we think is weather related, uh, but we're kind of back down to what, you know, the normal population level at about 26, 25, 26 million, uh, white wings, we're sitting at about 12 million breeding birds. Um, which is about, you know, we've kind of leveled off. Those birds have, have been expanding out of the Rio Grande Valley for 30 years now, yeah. 30 plus years. They're, they're expanding out of Texas. Uh, but what we're seeing in Texas now is we had that line going up, 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 up. And then four or five years ago, it kind of started leveling off. 
between 12 and 15 million. Okay. Uh, and so do a lot of these birds head south? We think based on a lot of banding data over a long period of time, uh, 50 to 60% of the birds in Texas stay in Texas. Um, mm -hmm. And then we, you know, the rest of them either head south. Of course, we get a lot of uh, wintering birds and, and stopover birds in the winter in the fall and winter. But um, there's with white wings, there's a lot we don't know. Uh, you know, the historical population in the valley we we know was migratory. Uh, but as they've expanded and they've kind of moved into urban areas, we think about 80 percent of the population in Texas is urban or suburban based. No, we and see a lot, a lot of, of them up here. Yeah, yeah, a lot of those birds we think are non-migratory because they don't need to leave. They've got food and water. Um, the cities stay a little bit warmer in the winter, uh, so they don't need to go anywhere. So uh, that's one thing that's kind of on my to-do list. As soon as uh, telemetry technology gets a little bit better and a little cheaper, a little more affordable, uh, well, I want to start tracking tracking these birds throughout the year and kind of see what their their ecology is and how they're using these these urban areas and and uh, moving in and out. And do white wings have the same like nesting? Um, behavior is morning dove well they're not we don't think they're quite as prolific they will have multiple broods uh but we don't think it's up to you know five or six um but it could be you know but one difference for sure that we know these days is you know that historical population was very um colonial so they nest in these big dense colonies down in south texas and a lot of the urban birds they're not anymore uh, mm -hmm. so that's kind of a question like how does that affect you know breeding success how does that affect how you know how many broods they might have we don't really know at this point okay and like a morning dove is it usually two eggs per, per right nest? yeah two eggs per nest sometimes one sometimes three uh but about the same timing too they'll they'll lay eggs uh incubate hatch and raise those chicks in about five to six weeks sometimes okay. four yeah um what about the invasive um, Eurasian collared dove. Are we seeing an increase in their population or have they leveled out as well? It's really hard to know. Um, the way we do our surveys, you know, we capture all doves that we see, um, but those birds are kind of, we, so we have a rural survey that kind of target morning doves and we have an urban survey that kind of captures, uh, targets white wings. And Eurasians are kind of in that interface where, you know, they're, they're, there's always a pair at a farmhouse. There's always a couple just outside of town, but they're in mm -hmm. town too. Um, so we don't get enough observations to know, to have a really, uh, a strong estimate, but we think they've pretty much leveled off and kind of, you know, if you look at what they did in Europe, um, there's a lot of literature, a lot of, of records that came from Europe when they moved across the European continent in about 200 years, colonized the entire continent. That's essentially what they've done here. They showed up in Florida in the late seventies, early eighties, they think from a captive population. Uh, the first sighting in Texas was I think 96. Uh, and since then, they are now found everywhere from Alaska to Panama, uh, oh, wow. but not, I don't think they're in, you know, they're not in the densities that you'd find our native doves. So they, they're well documented in Europe. Uh, the young will disperse several hundred miles and just find the next suitable spot, you know, the next farmhouse, the next town, whatever. So they kind of leapfrog across the landscape, uh, but they're not found in, you know, the big densities that you might find uh, morning doves or white wings. Interesting. Are they, um, someone told me, and it might have been, I don't know, it might have been Corey Mason a long time ago, said that they'll push, um, well, they'll take over the nest of like a, a morning dove or a, a white wing. Yeah, there's there's a lot of. Uh, Which made me hate them. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of documentation of individual interactions that, you know, they're bigger, they're more aggressive. Um, uh -huh. They'll they'll knock birds off a of feeder, that kind of thing. But um at the population level, we're not really seeing any impacts. Um, you know, that's, that's something that's always kind of on our radar that a lot of people have looked at. Uh, but at this point, you know, there's, we're not seeing major impacts or implications, yeah. you know, and I think a part of that is there's a lot of food on the landscape for doves. Uh, there's, you know, habitat for nesting is not really limited. Uh, these birds will nest as you, you know, in your backyard. I, mm -hmm. I've got a buddy who's got one nesting on his kid's basketball goal in the backyard. Um, so, you know, the habitat and, and resources aren't necessarily limiting. So I think that's kind of a big factor on why we're not seeing uh, uh, some impacts from those birds, but I, it very well could be in the future. I've been doing this for 12 years and I feel like the, the stigma attached to those has kind of waned a little bit. Like it was kind of a negative thing uh, 10 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. Like these dove really suck. They're going to compete with our native 
our native species. So really that that's kind of gone away. It doesn't seem like they really are at all. So, right. So. Yeah. They're just, they're what everybody calls them. They're bonus birds now. Yeah. Yeah. They're fun. Um, let's do this. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back and actually look at some of the hunting data and uh, get your take on how you think this upcoming season is going to play out. Sure. All right. Put a break in there. Oh, and thanks for sticking around, man. Certainly appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So you talked about the population of morning dove and, and white wing um, as we head into the season here being somewhere around 25 million for morning dove, 12 million for white wing. How many dove do Texas hunters kill annually? Uh, historically, in a typical year, we're shooting around 5 million morning doves and 2 to 3 million white wings. Um, the past few years, we, we saw a big drop in hunters in 2017 mm -hmm. um, from about 450 to 300 or so. Uh, so a pretty significant drop. And uh, we kind of assumed that was a Hurricane Harvey effect, uh, but they haven't gone back up yet. We're kind of still sitting at that 300,000 hunter mark. Uh, so hunter and harvest are very, very related. Um, you know, so when we saw the drop in hunters, we saw a subsequent drop in harvest. Uh, these days we're shooting three and a half to 4 million, uh, morning doves and one and a half to two, um, white wings. So five or 6 million birds. I wonder what percentage of those are shot in the first, like 10 days of the season, the first two weekends. Yeah. The majority, um, we think around 85% are shot in the first two or three weeks of September. Really? Yeah. Okay. yeah I mean, I do it too. I go the first week or two and then the field that I was hunting is shot out. And if I, you know, get an invite where somebody has them, I mean, I'll go again, but um, I think that's pretty much the mentality of most dove hunters go and it's good. Right. And it's kind of a two part deal. Um, you know, people move on to deer hunting or whatever after the mm -hmm. first couple weekends, but also those first two weekends, you've got, all those birds available for harvest, all those young birds that were hatched this year, all the adults, you know, it's a, it's a big number of birds right then. Uh, and then later in September, the second or third, fourth week, birds start moving out, northern birds start moving in. So things kind of fluctuate. Uh, and that's when people start having a scout, you know, and they, some weekends mm -hmm. aren't as good, but that early opener, that's kind of, you know, universally, even not just in Texas, but across uh, everywhere that they hunt dove, those first two weekends are, are, that's when everybody goes, that's when most of the harvest takes place yeah um what about as far as lead versus steel shot i know Corey probably gave us some information on a study that was done years ago mm -hmm. but i don't know if that's dated or or what your take is on that i have a, i'm fortunate to have uh kent cartridge as a sponsor so they send me uh steel dove loads and i personally have not noticed any difference on lethality i mean dove are such a small and wimpy target uh exactly. to be frank so I, I figured i'd get your take on that though yeah uh cory was involved in a study that parks and wildlife did um years ago that was it was strictly a lethality study you know there have been a number of studies on uh on lead ingestion from doves you know in certain dove fields they pick up lead for grit and how that might affect populations and there's uh, different results from some of those studies is kind of inconclusive um you know and people interpret some of that different ways but as far as lethality lead versus steel uh that study that that parks and wildlife did was was really really good and kind of showed that as long as you hit the bird you know because they had they had blind tests for these hunters they had no idea what they were shooting lead steel yeah. whatever and uh as long as they hit the bird you know like lethality there's no difference between lead and steel so mm -hmm. um and like you said you, you didn't notice any difference i've been shooting steel uh at doves for many many years now and you know, I dropped down in a size. I went from, you know, seven and a half or so to sixes. Um, I feel like it's got a little bit more knockdown for some reason, but yeah. I shoot 20 gauge too. Um, but I, I think most hunters, if you put, you know, if you give them blind shells, they're not going to know the difference. And, and, you know, I think the study kind of proved that. Right. Right. Well, in 20 gauge, I think as we get older, it's like, why do I keep beating myself up with a 12 gauge? <laughs> I, well, that's what yeah. it was for me anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've got a 20 gauge auto. That's just the smoothest shooting gun and you can shoot oh, it all day. I love it. Yeah. I've got a, I've got a 20 gauge semi-auto and um, then I also have a 12 gauge over under, which looks really fancy and stuff. And, but as far as which one hurts my shoulder, mm, I'm going with the 20, even though the other yeah. one, it looks really cool. Uh, but yeah, no, give me the 20 all day. Um, let's see what else I was going to ask you. 
What about uh, number of shots per bird? I've heard that it's like it takes the average Texas hunter seven shots to kill one dove. Is that accurate? Yeah, there's. I don't know that, that anyone's done a I mean, Texas specific be... study. Uh huh. Yeah, but uh, there's been a lot of stuff. I mean, from the 1950s to to present, I, there's a dozens of studies out there, that, and it usually ranges four to eight shells. Wow. Uh, so you could probably say the average hunter shoots about six per bird. So they're which they're shooting less birds than beers drank out there. Really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which I'm yeah, not advocating, much. but I know you guys do it. Um. So okay people need to work on those numbers but at least the manufacturing uh, fire the um shot shell manufacturers are doing well yeah. um, yeah. let's see if there was anything else here what um other than michigan what states in the central flyway don't allow dove hunting oh that's a good question uh are there a lot no no most of them are in the northeast um you know far northeast delaware mm -hmm. uh new hampshire those places like up there I don't even know off the top of my head. I'd have to, I have to look at the map. Okay. Um, yeah. Michigan is the one that stands out. I always hear those guys complaining about it. Yeah. I don't know if it's their state bird or what the deal is there, but. It, same kind of deal with, uh, you know, the controversy over cranes. Um, a lot of people in certain states, there's a history that goes back where those birds were kind of revered as, you know, non-game species. And they just, that's just kind of stuck. Mm -hmm. Um yeah i guess biblically yeah, they're, they're like the sign of peace but yeah they also taste great <laughs> <laughs> they're also they're also the most important game bird in the u.s yeah so, really they are yeah there's more more uh dove hunters in the u.s than any other i think all the other game birds combined um oh. you know they're by far the most hunters uh as far as birds go in texas yeah. um yeah well it's such a social sport you don't have to be quiet you don't really have to wear a camo if you don't want to Mm -hmm. uh put out a mojo or two and you know sit your ass in a field that you know has dove in it yep you're gonna have opportunities uh my kids love it and they don't even shoot i mean they're they're not old enough to my son just got a 410 and i he's like a season away i still think from being able to, to hunt with it um but man they love to go so yeah yeah it's a great sport for people you know there's a lot of uh these days we're seeing kind of a shift to a lot of uh younger adults who've never hunted coming out of the city who, who want to kind of get into it. And that's one of the easiest uh, sports that they can get into. They just need, you know, like you said, shotgun shells, place to go. Um, there's not a whole lot you can mess up necessarily. Uh, just if you know what a dove looks like and, you know, just get out there and go. Um, it's great for kids. Like you said, give them a 410 or a 20 gauge, get them started. Um, you don't have to sit there super quiet, super still. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a great, great way to get people into the sport what um what is your prediction for for this season you said conditions were good i mean i just said i have had this bird nest four times on my patio yeah and you're up in the mckinney area mm -hmm. yeah um so looking at our surveys um we didn't do surveys last year from 2020 with covid uh numbers are up or either at or or up from 2019 pretty much statewide but the further north you go, the further we are um, below the long-term average. And I, I think a lot of that has to do with uh, the winter storm that we had. Uh, initially, I didn't expect much of an impact. You know, I got a lot of reports of mortalities from, you know, with morning doves and, and especially white wings, uh, but not enough to really make me think that we would see much of an impact. But uh, with white wings, I can say pretty confidently uh, in the panhandle, Parts of uh, the closer you get to the Red River, you know, maybe north of Dallas and some of those North Texas areas, uh, we did see quite a drop in white wing numbers, which is unusual because, you, you know, like I said, white wings, they, they've been on the up and up or at least level yeah. for many years. Uh, so that I'm pretty sure is a, is a winter storm effect. And the, uh, the numbers that we have for morning doves in the central and north zones are also lower than I expected. And so I think that might be an uh, effect from the winter storm, too. But like you said, we've had, um, you know, really wet uh, and, and cool, relatively cool summer across the state. Rangelands have looked really good. Um, so it's kind of a, it's going to be a mixed forecast. It's, it, it's really region specific. So there's, there's areas like uh, I know around, around Hondo Uvalde, they had some really bad hailstorms mm -hmm. uh, back in April and May that probably knocked nesting back. So that there's probably, that's kind of a peak nesting time. So uh, there might be areas like that, that, uh, might have got hit a little harder with some of those storms 
like I said, the panhandle with the winter storms, they're probably going to see less white wings this year. Um, but I think with this productive season that we've had, there's a lot of breeding birds that have been pushed out. You know, we're getting hatchier productions, I think, really high this year. Uh, so hopefully that'll kind of offset any of those losses. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking central north zone, hit or miss in a few places, but most for the most part, we're sitting at about an average season, maybe maybe a better season. You know, one thing I think we'll see uh, is because the habitat is so good this this far into August, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of food and water on the landscape once birds start coming in from those northern states. So, uh, you know, late se later season hunting might be really, really good this year. Um, the one prediction that I, I think I can make pretty confidently is the south zone is it should be on fire this year. Um, mm. We're seeing some of the highest estimates we've ever seen for both morning and white wing doves um, ha kind of has been that way for the past two or three years. Um, and it, it's just, they've been, on, they've been on fire for the past few years. And I think this year is going to be even better. Okay. So a good prediction there. Um, let's see. There was one other thing I was to ask you. Oh, you mentioned late season hunting. So what, what is our framework this year? And how many people actually hunt that? that uh, was it 10 days or two weeks in December? Yeah. Um, so we have 90 days uh, okay. that we can set the seasons and we can have one split in Texas. Uh, and typically what we try to do, because we know it gets pretty cold up, up in the North zone, um, you know, in, in December. So the late season is not as important as some of the, you know, like in the South zone, we can push that late season all the way into late January. Um, January 25th would be the federal cutoff. Um, so what we try to do is stagger that and push the first part, first half of the season a little bit longer in, in the North zone and the second half a little bit longer in the South zone to give people that opportunity late, uh, December, January. I don't have a really good handle on how many people actually utilize that second half. Uh, we know it's not very many, like, like we talked about, most people are, hunting I think I've gone early. once. In yeah. Most people hunt early year. September. Uh, but if you go to the South zone, you can have some. I mean, I can't tell you how many crane hunts have turned into on the coast Corpus Christi area have turned into dove hunts because the cranes <laughs> didn't cooperate. So we just went back to the truck, you know, grabbed our dove guns and, and went back out. And uh, the South zone has some really, really good late season opportunities. And every year I hear about more and more people taking advantage of that. Okay. And when will that, when is that? I mean, it's, it, Christmas falls into that for a reason, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, I have to pull this up, looking it up I, right now. I'm looking it up because uh, every year the way we 10 do 10 days or two weeks, uh, it's usually, what do we do? We usually do about, it's, it's longer than that. I okay. have to look it up right now. This always confuses me because we have, we're coming off last season's dates, talking about this season's dates. And in my job, we're already talking about next year's dates. <laughs> so I always have to look this up. Uh, so North Zone. First half, September 1st and November 12th. Second, they all start the second half on December 17th this year. That's to allow people to hunt around Christmas, New Year's. Um, so like the South Zone, we're talking about over a month on that second half, hmm. um, about 40 days or so. Uh, Central Zone, about a month, 30 days. And then the North Zone, that second half is going to be about two or three weeks, okay. two and a half weeks. Yeah. What, um, what percentage of folks... But actually, don't give me a percentage. Do we do we have any idea of the number of people that come from out of state to hunt dove in Texas? Is it a big attraction or is it mostly just resident hunters? It's mostly resident. I think in a given year, five to 10 percent could be usually around five percent or less, I think. Um, okay. What's really interesting is uh, how many people move around zones within Texas, like the South Zone, about half the South Zone hunters are from don't live in the South Zone. Right. It's a lot of people move, you know, head down there to hunt every year. Uh -huh. Have you ever done Argentina? I have never done Argentina. Not yet. It's on the list. Yeah. I put a deposit down in 2019 and then COVID hit. So we yeah. haven't made that, that up yet, but uh, it's going to happen sooner or later, but I'm, I'm going to an area intentionally to I'm shooting a couple thousand dove in a day. doesn't really do anything for me. Mm -hmm. A couple hundred be cool. And then, but we're going so we can also hunt ducks. Yeah. Um, so they've got some teal species and stuff yep. down there that obviously we've, we've never seen. So um, that's kind of be our, our deal. I think right. there you could, you could also do upland uh, if you want to do that. So really a lot of opportunity for wing yeah. shooting. Yeah. That quantity thing is not, not for me either. I, I'm more about 
what species can I see? You know, I'd like to uh -huh. see the huge flocks of those, but um, sure. shooting a thousand is not, <laughs> not for me either. <laughs> not knocking you guys that have shot 5,000 dove in yeah. a day, but uh, more power to you. And I'm sure you're uh, pinning shoulder surgeries. I hope that they go well. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, man. Well, hey, Owen, I certainly appreciate the time. Thanks for jumping on today and talking all things uh, dove with us. I hope it's a great season and uh, take a newbie hunting. Yeah. Yeah. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Cable. All right. Take it easy. Yep. You too.